Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And with, the, with that, let's go ahead and get into the stories for this episode. Starting off over at extremetech.com, Apple's A7 Cyclone CPU has been detailed, a desktop class chip that has more in common with Haswell than Crate. Now, Haswell is Intel's uh, latest x86-64 uh, core series uh, desktop chip. And um, the, the story basically starts off, you know, six months ago when Apple first announced the uh, iPhone 5S, uh, they announced the A7 system on a chip and said it was 64 bits and a desktop class architecture. Well, Anantech and various other websites six months after the fact uh, Apple has has published to uh, various code sharing sites details um, needed for compilers about about the new A7 chip, and turns out that when they said desktop class architecture uh, at the announcement, you know it wasn't marketing hyperbole. I mean, this thing is a seriously beefy processor. It has more in common. Uh, with desktop processors than it does with mobile processors. So um, it comes with six, it's a six uh, issue uh, architecture. So you can have six micro ops dispatch per cycle, 192, uh, um, 192 entry reorder buffer, a uh, mispredict penalty of on the pipeline of 14 to 19 cycles, which is typical of like a Haswell type uh, class architecture, four integer pipelines, two branch units. It's really wide. It can decode, issue, and retire up to six instructions per clock cycle, which by comparison, the beefiest other mobile processors from ARM, uh, Swift and Crate, uh, can't do more than three per, and this is per core. Um, there's also, like I said before, 192 entry reorder buffer. It's the same size as Haswell's reorder buffer, which is Intel's desktop architecture for desktop CPUs. Um, I mean, seriously, seriously, uh, a beefy processor. As Anantech says uh, on their analysis of the processor, with six decoders and nine ports of execution units, Cyclone is big, bigger than anything else that goes in a phone. When Apple announced the A7 system on a chip, one of the slides said it had a 64-bit desktop class architecture, and now we know that it wasn't just marketing hyperbole. They were not kidding. Uh, where Swift was very similar to Crate and other mobile ARM cores, Cyclone is a big departure from the usual thin and light approach of building mobile CPUs. So this kind of br uh, brings the question, you know, what is Intel or what is Apple planning to do with such a beefy processor? I mean, this is like a, a serious processor. And there's a couple of a couple of things that they may be doing. You know, there's a, a new paradigm called race to sleep where basically instead of trying to be as efficient as possible and slowing down execution or, you know, going to sleep really frequently, you know, it, it's actually the, uh, a lot of designers have been discovering that it's much more efficient to do as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and then go to sleep. So you're as asleep as long as possible to reduce the number of times you wake up and go to sleep because that transition actually, A, costs you performance and B, costs you power. And so the thought process was if we could coalesce all of our instructions to where we could get one nice big fat, well, not necessarily fat wide execution window, but we could get it down to just one execution window, do everything we can without going to sleep, just do it as quickly as possible. They've discovered that when they do that, the amount of time the processor is awake is significantly shorter and there are significantly less transitionary periods between asleep and awake, which 
over the course of time reduces how much power is used, reduces how, uh, increases how much time the processor is asleep and reduces how much time the processor is awake. When the processor is awake, it's going at 100%, you know, full throttle, and then it, it goes, you know, goes as fast as it can and then powers back down. Another hypothesis as to why Apple is putting such a giant beefy uh, processor in its phone is, is they're doing some prep work to lay the groundwork to use uh, the same processor architecture in their desktop class system. So not only just in the iPhone 5S and the iPad Air, but they're also planning to potentially use it in their notebooks and the iMac, MacBook Pro, et cetera. Uh, another hypothesis is potentially Apple is just trying to be really forward looking, realizing that, you know, particularly in the tablet arena, as people start to use their tablets for more and more things, there are going to be, you know, heavier workloads that their tablets are going to be expected to do. And so they're just trying to get that groundwork in place ahead of time. So pretty interesting re uh, article. Definitely uh, give it a read if you want to know, you know, a lot of the little nitty gritty details on what, you know, what, what's entails uh, the A7 processor from Apple. And an Apple-related story over at CNET.com, Apple says Samsung copied the iPhone after suffering a crisis of design. This is an update story to the Apple-Samsung uh, lawsuit uh, shenanigans that have been happening over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, essentially, um, what Sam Apple is saying is Samsung copied Apple's iPhone as it tried to figure out how to react and compete with the device. Um, Apple's attorneys told the court this today on Tuesday in San Jose. Because of that, Samsung should pay Apple about $2 billion in damages. That's a lot of cash. Uh, pretty interesting read. Definitely check it out if you want to follow uh, the Apple-Samsung saga that's happening in the courtrooms. From Droid Life over at droid-life.com, Samsung announces the Tab 4 series, 10.1 inch, 8 inch, and 7 inch tablets. Like clockwork, Samsung revealed that it's refreshing its Galaxy Tab line of tablets, dubbed the Tab 4 series. These new devices come in 10.1 inches, 8 inches, and 7 inch screen sizes and feature, what else? Samsung software. The details of the announcement confirm a lot of the leaks that happened last week. The Tab 4 series evoked the Galaxy Note 3 and Galaxy S5 design-wise, but pack lower-end hardware. So these are kind of more of a budget-type tablets. Um, I'm curious personally to see, you know, how well they do in the marketplace because, you know, Apple has shown, if anything, people don't want a slow tablet. When they go and spend five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars on a tablet, they expect it to perform. So uh, we'll see. From the fool.com over at Motley Fool, Office for iPad is Microsoft Corporation's best move in years. Microsoft is marching to the beat of a different drum these days. The new rhythm was officially unveiled when the company's new CEO took stage on March 27th to announce that its Office Productivity Suite was finally available for Apple's iPad. While the move in and of itself may only have a small impact on Microsoft's bottom line, it signaled that the software giant is finally embracing the multi-platform approach it will need to succeed in a fragmented mobile environment. I've been saying this for ages. Microsoft needs to get off their high horse and start making software for all of the devices out there. You know, they cannot expect, they are a primarily a software company. They have been since the beginning of time. They do not do software and hardware combined like, like how Apple does very well. Historically, they have not done it. They may do that in the future and, and actually be really good at it. But in terms of what I've seen from Microsoft when they're trying to do the whole software hardware meld thing, it doesn't work. I, it just, it, I, I don't, it, it's, there's, it just doesn't work. Uh, they are a software company that has been in their DNA since the beginning of the company. And so uh, even though they do have hardware like the Microsoft mouse, Microsoft keyboard, it's not a full integrated thing like what Apple does. You know, they don't make uh, the truck and the box that the truck comes in and, 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 you know, they don't make everything. 
and they can't they can't possibly expect to without you know tripping up all kinds of uh, lawsuits from everybody else who does that. So they need to focus on software, which means software that runs on other platforms other than Microsoft Windows. Microsoft Windows is great, but they don't make the hardware that Microsoft Windows runs on. Same thing with for Microsoft Phone. You know, Apple needs to realize that there's Android and iOS, and in the future there may be other operating systems out there that are mobile operating systems that they may need to support. So, you know, particularly when it comes to their bread and the butter, like uh, their office suite. I mean, this is, you know, the vast majority of the money Microsoft makes is from Office and Windows. Those are the two things, particularly in business. And business users, what do they want? They want their tablet. They want Office on their tablet. You know, I mean, this is not rocket science. You know, I'm uh, for one, I'm happy Microsoft is finally doing it. You know, it, ju it just makes sense. From businessweek.com, BlackBerry to end sales with T-Mobile US after iPhone, Apple iPhone spat. So BlackBerry isn't renewing its uh, contract with T-Mobile US Inc. It expires later this month following a spat about the fourth largest US carrier's wireless promotion of Apple's iPhones. Wah, wah, wah. Existing BlackBerry users on a T-Mobile contract will not be affected once the contract ends April 25th. Uh, the Ontario company said in a statement, however, it will help customers to move on to other carriers, carriers if they want to keep using their BlackBerry phones. So, uh, you know, I, I almost think that's an April Fool's joke since this, today is Tuesday, April 1st. But uh, it's not surprising that Black, I mean, BlackBerry's been on the decline for a while. You know, we've been kind of seeing them in their death throes for a couple of years now. And it'll be probably a couple of more years before they finally do go away for good. But they will eventually finally go away for good because they, they, they clearly missed the boat in the phone department and they clearly are having trouble adapting and have been for years. So uh, we'll see what comes of it. From hngn.com, headline and global news. This is kind of under the science-y. I thought it was interesting, so I would share it. It's not necessarily tech. Zebra stripes are to keep flies away, a new study says. That's right. Researchers at the University of California at Davis have finally discovered that zebra have, zebras have stripes to keep flies away. The research team found, found evidence that zebras and other horse-related species with stripes live in areas that have lots of blood-sucking insects. The team published their findings in the science journal Nature Communications. And, uh, you know, as is usually the case, zebras and stripes don't go, or go together like uh, peanut butter and jelly. You know, it's, it's just something that... Uh, appears to be a coping mechanism because their fur is not as thick as other species that live in that area as well. And so there you have it. Give the article a read if you want to read up more about it. It's pretty interesting. That will do it for this edition of The Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Or if you're on YouTube, you can find them underneath uh, the episode here in the show notes area. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.